Where Ocheti. Sakoin. Yeah, Ocheti Shakoin. Where is it? Uh, Standing Rock. That's the main camp in Standing Rock, uh, North Dakota. I'll show you in the presentation. Oh, I'll actually okay. show, you'll see it on a map because I wanted to show how remote. I, I, how assumed, I assumed it was in Papua New Guinea. No. <laughs> Ocheti Shakuin is the Lakota name for the Great Sioux Nation. It, it means uh, the seven fires, seven council okay. fires. So, so you're, you're, you're you think you're remote, though. Yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> I met a guy in Papua New Guinea a couple of weeks ago. Yeah? You don't mean that very often. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really, really in the middle of nowhere. It's, I mean, it's an hour when you can go straight, right? You know, drive straight. It's about 45 minutes to the closest city. Um, but with the roadblocks in place where we couldn't drive to it, it was an hour and a half to the closest town. So, yeah. No. Um, huh? Roadblocks. Yeah. Why? In America. So, did you did you see yesterday's presentation? Yeah. I, I know you did. Did you see yesterday's no. presentation? Okay. So, so let me do this real quick because you know it's not going to harm anything since we've got a little bit of time. Um, let me just uh, scoot forward to some. So this is actually also in today's presentation. Oh, come on, slideshow. Um, so this particular slide is also in today's slideshow. Wow. This is, so I did not have the guts to take this picture from the other side of the, the roadblock. Um, so this is, from going from south towards north. If you're coming from north, from Bismarck and Mandan, down towards camp, um, the, you can kind of see the, the army guys back there. Um, it was armed, it was manned by armed National Guard soldiers. Uh, and as I explained yesterday, um, basically, if you were pasty skinned like me, they just kind of said, have you been down this road recently? And if you said no, they'd say, well, we just want to let you know that there's a protest going on down here and a bunch of people camping. And some of them are walking on the road, so you should drive carefully as you go down this road. Uh, if you did not have pasty skin, uh, they would ask for your ID. They would run it. If you had any warrants, they would arrest you. Uh, and in many cases, they just, if they couldn't arrest them, they would send them down the side road and make them go all the way around the long route to get back to camp. They wouldn't let them go straight through. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I did a lot while I was there was use my white privilege because I had a, a van with six passenger seats and, you know, I would pack the van full of people and and stuff that needed to be transported and drive back and forth through that uh, roadblock and, and be the pasty face that they saw and they would let us through. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these. Um, this is, like I said, from yesterday. This, I mean, there were command vehicles. They were, they had uh, stingrays, MC catchers uh, to catch our phone calls, to, uh, mess with our, our phones and our internet. Um, uh, this is, you know, a, a picture of one of the protest actions. Um, this is a picture of not a cell tower. Um, the, the, local, the local phone companies were like, oh yes, it's a legitimate cell phone tower, but the, the tower was put up right after the camp was put up. Um, and it was actually near a small camp that only had five to ten people, um, but it was it was a frontline camp that was going across um, uh, a across the line of where they were putting the the pipelines in, and the signal from the cell tower didn't even reach to the main camp that had more people, and there are no houses 
anywhere in range of this tower. Like, there's no question. The only reason that they put that tower there was for surveillance. Um, and, I mean, this is some of the military gear we were up against, and LRAD is a long-range acoustic device. Basically, it's a sound machine that if they turn up the if they turn up the signal hard enough, it can literally liquefy your insides. N not joking. Of course, they don't generally do that. <laughs> but it still hurts a lot when they turn on that sound, even when they're not turning it on the high. Um, and we don't know what the long range effects of those things might be. That's true. We do not know the long range effects. Um, they were using low intensity, um, uh, low intensity <laughs> conflict methods on us the entire time we were there, pretty much twenty four seven. There were some sort of aircraft over top of our heads. I nicknamed this particular one the Happy Yellow Helicopter. This was the most common vehicle to be over our heads, but there were also a couple of Cessnas and another helicopter, a blue and white helicopter. Um, and they actually got in trouble um, because they were repainting the the tail numbers on these vehicles. Yeah, and that's an obscure tail number. <laughs> You're not they, to do that. Yeah, so, so actually we were keeping track of the tail numbers and discovered in one particular case, the tail number on a Cessna was the tail number for a commercial DC-10. Um, so, uh, this, uh, again, shows the kind of uh, military equipment that they were using ag uh, against the water protectors. Um, that is on a ridge over top of the most populous camp, which is Tishakoing, uh, and in the, the far side, is that your, that's your right, yes, um, <laughs> on your right, that vehicle has a rocket launcher on the top that that was pointed at the camp that had men women children elderly people disabled people um, at the time that this was up there there were about seven thousand people in camp it's also um, for those that don't know those lrats are military grade crowd control they're not right. civilian grade crowd control <laughs> right which, which was incredibly upsetting because it was the, the badge on that man's vest said police and it's kind of like Maybe on a technicality. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, they they were, it was pretty brutal repression. Yeah? I was um, pretty heavily involved in NATO protests in Chicago. CPD acquired, Chicago Police Department acquired two LRADs and they fired at one point. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a police happen now. I, so I went around and, and did some research uh, before the first time I gave the security version of this presentation. Um, and discovered that the military equipment that they were using on us, a lot of it they've been using in, in urban areas as well. They used LRADs on Ferguson, they used LRADs in Chicago, they, I mean, uh, the, this, I don't want to get too much into the, the politics of it, but I'll just leave it hanging in the air. This is something we really need to deal with in our country right now. Um, so that's, that's just a quick uh, introduction to what we were facing at Standing Rock. Um, so let me switch to today's um, today's talk. Do, 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 do. Um, so we're you know we've given enough time. We can start this one. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, how we brought the internet to Ocheti Shakoing. I want to warn you that as I was putting together this um, this presentation, that the slideshow, I've given a version of this presentation and the presentation I gave yesterday several times now, but without slides, because I, I hate making slides. I'm like, um, you know, my one of my uh, incompetencies is anything around uh, visual design. So I know where I am incompetent and I avoid it like the plague. But today while I was making this particular slideshow, I found myself getting very emotional. So if I do get emotional <laughs> through this, I, I apologize in advance. 
Um, it was a really intense experience. So for those of you who have not heard of Standing Rock, um, you may have seen something, any of the things that are on this particular poster, which I randomly pulled off the internet and don't know who made it. Um, so the, the reason we were there is because a company called Energy Transfer Partners um, is building a pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, also known as DAPL, uh, across the state, actually across several states. It's uh, going from North Dakota to Indiana. And um, it's going under the Missouri River. Originally, it was supposed to go under the Missouri River up in Bismarck. Uh, the people of Bismarck did not like that and happened to be white, yes. And so the decision was made to uh, put the pipeline through this area just north of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Um, now, the land that it's going through uh, is not on the reservation, but it is on treaty land. The treaty land is much larger than the reservation territory. Uh, and according to that treaty, the, the signatories of the treaty should have had the opportunity to weigh in on whether or not a permit was given for going through that land. Uh, when some actual research was done, uh, the, there was proof found of what the uh, Sioux people were saying, that there were sacred burial grounds. Um, there is also uh, a tradition that the land that we were on, the Ochechi Shakoin camp, and the land that the, the pipeline goes through just directly north of what was Ochechi Shakoin camp uh, called Cannonball Ranch um, is, is also uh, a sacred ground. So Ochechi Shakoin doesn't have, well, it, it does have some burials in it, but it also has other uh, medicine in the land. It is a, a traditional place of medicine work. Uh, so that was one of the issues at hand. And of course, the other issue is this pipeline is going under the Missouri River. It doesn't matter where you put it under the Missouri River. If it leaks, <laughs> that has the potential to poison 18 million people downstream, uh, including the population of Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, which gets all of its water from uh, the Missouri River right there. So just to give you some idea of what the challenges might have been for bringing internet to this place, um, this kind of gives you an image of how remote this is. Um, there's a lot of nothing out there. Um, and Bismarck is, it, it's a city, but just to give you some idea, when Ocheti Shakoin uh, grew to 20,000 people. We were the third largest city, maybe it was the fourth, I think it's the third largest city in the entire state of North Dakota, okay? <laughs> so the, there's a lot of nothing there. Um, and uh, the, the place itself, the camp itself, is, is not in a well-served area. It's right next to a reservation. Now, in the grand scheme of things, if you live in Washington State and you see the reservations here, you think, oh, the reservations aren't so bad. Of course, if you actually live on a reservation here in North Dakota, or in, in Washington State, you might be able to tell the white folks that live nearby that, yeah, actually, you don't have all the services that the cities right next to you have. But if you're in the middle of nowhere in Indian country, um, the level of services available on the reservations are, I mean, I can't even compare it to third world countries, although I will. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it, it's not like being in the United States at all, okay? Um, the, the public monies that go into these uh, reservations are next to nothing. The, the infrastructure that's built in these areas is next to nothing. Many of the people on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, for instance, uh, if they're not, 
directly in a town. They might not have electricity at all. They might not have flush toilets at all. Um, the, the community is extremely poor. And in fact, uh, the town of Cannonball, which is the closest town to where Uchitishakuing is, is one of the poorest towns on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Um, mind you, there are even poorer reservations uh, within Sioux country. Um, so uh, this is that picture that I was showing you before, but I cropped it this time um, so that you don't see my neck warmer uh, in the window. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, just coming up to this particular um, uh, roadblock, this was the longest running roadblock. It was not the only roadblock. And later, after October 27th, you couldn't get through here at all. Okay, so before October 27th, you could get through here. After October 27th, you, there was no choice. You had to go the long way around to get to camp. You couldn't go straight down 1806. Um, here are a, a couple of pictures of camp in October, just to give you a feel for what it looked like and what it felt like. Um, there were, oh, so one thing to, to just fill you in on the story. So it's really windy out there. I mean, really windy. Uh, the day after I arrived, they had the first serious windstorm of the fall uh, with 60 mile an hour winds. And basically the only things left standing were some of the reinforced army tents that had metal on the, the, the you know, what is it, steel infrastructure on the inside. Um, the ones that were military type but had lesser structures on the inside did not make it. There were some army tents that collapsed uh, and the teepees were standing. But basically all of the t normal tents that people brought to stay in, they were flat um, or worse, the poles were just broken into pieces. There were so many dead tents. You mean the dome tents wouldn't survive? Dome tents did not survive at all. Not even, <laughs> just no. <laughs> and that's when we started telling people, don't bring dome tents. It, you know, you have to have something more serious. Um, so right before I went out to Standing Rock um, and I, I had known that I wanted to go out there and had started planning for it. And uh, a friend of mine introduced me to this guy, Roberto Monge. Um, this guy is, is one serious kick-ass dude. Uh, he's a Salvadoran immigrant to the United States. He came here, I believe it was on his 10th birthday, actually. Um, I know it was on his birthday. He was woken up early in the morning. Um, they didn't tell him where they were going and they, in the middle of the night, uh, stuck uh, him and his siblings onto a plane and brought them to the US. The reason being that his father was uh, one of the founders of the FM FMLN, the FMLN and the Salvadoran Revolution. Um, and his uncle was one of the founders of Radio Venceremos. If you've never heard of Radio Venceremos, you should totally Google that stuff because it's pretty cool. These guys, um, you know, built a pirate radio station. They had no clue what the heck they were doing. And um, quite a few hackery adventures in the process. Um, so this guy, um, both because of his, uh, you know, revolutionary uh, heritage and also because of his Native American heritage, Central American, Native American, but Native nonetheless. And one of the issues that his father was standing up for was indigenous rights in El Salvador, um, which indigenous rights in El Salvador is kind of like a contradiction in terms. Um, <laughs> so, so this was a, a very important issue to him. And he happens to be a network administrator in Southern California and we connected and it was like, ah, yes, we're going to do this thing. We're, we're going to bring the internet to Ocheti. Um, 
Now, I knew that Geeks Without Bounds had a lot of other things that we could do, but this was certainly a, a first a first step, a, a thing that we could bring to uh, the camps in order to help with the technological situation in that environment. So he started doing some research, and he discovered that the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe has their own telecom. Uh, and this is very important because the, you know, the whole Standing Rock um, story has two major pieces to it, right? It's protecting the water, and it's also standing for indigenous rights. Um, and being able to support the tribal telecom became a very important issue for us. We didn't want to be connecting to a non-tribal telecom when there was a tribal option right there. Um, but also, there was a matter of trust. Uh, we, it, once I got into camp, once we got into camp and discovered how serious the cyber warfare against people at camp was, we had no trust for any ISPs um, that weren't tribal to begin with, right? Um, so we knew we wanted to connect to Standing Rock Telecom, and we knew that they had uh, a high bandwidth uh, internet backhaul coming into the reservation. Um, we also knew that there was no way you were going to get fiber into camp. Um, now, <laughs> let me take a, a short detour here and tell you that it took us a little over a month to get the internet actually functioning in camp. Uh, and during that month, uh, I was getting phone calls and emails almost every day from people telling me that they knew how to get the internet working in three days. Now, first off, when we showed up, we thought we were going to get the internet working in one week. <laughs> Second off, the things people were telling us we should do included bring fiber to camp. <laughs> um, and a lot of the people were like, well, what's the problem? Just bring in a, a satellite dish. Well, if you've got 7,000 people and one satellite dish, in, you know, you guys are technically savvy enough to know what the bandwidth of a satellite dish is to begin with and to realize that that is not going to work for 7,000 people or even 300 people. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then there's the other issue of it is really expensive. Um, towards the end of the time that we were at Standing, Camp, Standing Rock, um, we actually brought in a satellite as, as backup internet. Uh, and the, the setup we had, we thought was going to cost us $1,500 a month. Uh, it ended up costing about $4,000 in the first month. Uh, because of how much bandwidth was being used by just a very few people who actually had access to that backup internet connection. So uh, bringing satellite to an environment like this is not, it, it's just not an option. So, so what is the option? Um, <laughs> we considered that. We were like, how many bits can we get around the ankle of a pigeon? Um, and then we were like, damn, carrier pigeons are extinct. Um, <laughs> but luckily, ubiquity is not extinct. Um, so these ubiquity dishes, um, you can think of it as long distance Wi-Fi. Um, and the, the big dishes you see there, that's the ubiquity power beam. And that's what we used for our long distance connections. And then the smaller dishes, are uh, ubiquity nano beams, and we use those for the shorter hop, and you'll see that in just a moment. And in our original plan, we thought we were going to use a project that went through um, the Geeks Without Bounds Humanitarian Accelerator a few years ago called Landline, LDLN. Now, Landline is a project that was started at a hackathon right after Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Uh, it was the idea of a, a few Filipinos uh, living in New York who had heard about how 
all communications were completely destroyed by the typhoon, and that was slowing down the disaster response. And they thought, well, we can use Raspberry Pis and stick two radios on them. One radio will be for Wi-Fi. One radio will be uh, open BTS to provide mobile phone service. And then we'll set it up into a mesh with uh, certain resources directly on the boxes so that if you've only got one box available, you've got a, basically a web server that you can use to, to put information about who's in the area, about uh, different issues that are happening within that disaster situation. And then once that meshes up with others, that database will sync in a cluster database with all the other ones so that you can get that information out. And it's, um, it's a system that heals itself very nicely. Um, and it's really a very clever situation, a very clever project for disasters. And I thought this would be good for our environment. Um, and uh, Roberto also spent some time on the Ubiquity site, the Ubiquity tools, laying out where we would connect the power beams. Uh, he found out where the internet comes into the, uh, the reservation, figured out that it was at a higher elevation than we were uh, at camp, and that you could basically beam the, the internet connection to a point just outside of camp, uh, which we would later call Hop Hill. And then from there, you could use the nano beams to point the connection back down into camp. Um, and he developed this uh, network map. Uh, it's perfectly safe to put this network map up for a couple of reasons. One, because the network doesn't exist at all anymore. And the other being that this particular map never happened as it appears here. Um, you'll notice that one of the things on this map is that we would have a Wi-Fi point at the sacred fire. Um, the best laid plans of mice and men. Um, one of the things that we didn't take into consideration before we got there was that this was not just a protest camp. This was a sacred site. It was a prayer camp. Uh, it was a ceremony. That whole, the whole nine months was one long Lakota ceremony. And so there were many things that you could and could not do in that space. Now, one of the things about Geeks Without Bounds, one of the reasons that uh, I loved the organization when I started out as a volunteer before I became an employee, and one of the reasons why I argued to keep it open when the founding executive director was burnt out and like, I, we're going to close down. And I said, no, no, you can't close down. And my punishment was becoming the executive director. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that I've always loved about Geeks Without Bounds is that we don't come in and tell people how they have to do things. We come into a, a community or a space and say, we have these skills, we have this knowledge. How can we help you with this? What would you like? What do you need? And, and we listen and pay attention and actually go with what the community needs. And if for some reason what they want to do absolutely goes against our ethics or morals, then we say, sorry, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that. You know, here are some resources, but we got to not. But, uh, you know, as long as something doesn't uh, interfere with our own personal ethics and morals or our organizational ethics and, or morals, we're, we're doing what the community told us to do. And like I said, if it does interfere with our own ethics and morals, we're not going to tell them they have to do X. We're just not going to do it, right? Um, it's, it's an intentional anti-colonialist attitude. Um, so that being the case, one of the first things that we did, um, you know, after we'd made all these lovely plans and talked to people that were at camp from outside of camp, when we actually arrived at camp and started talking to the elders and sitting around the sacred fire and, and learning what it was like to actually be in camp and what the rules were, there were a number of rules that were set out by the elders. One of them was 
there should be no internet whatsoever anywhere near the sacred fire. <laughs> um, a, another thing that they asked specifically was that they did not want the internet covering camp. They did want to have an intranet that didn't go to the outside world, but that would offer certain resources internally so that we could offer some educational resources to the kids that were going to the school because we had a school at camp. Um, and also that would offer certain resources to the medical community in the healing center. Uh, and we also, once we, you know, like I said, once we got there and discovered the, the threat level we were under, we wanted to have a better secure communication that didn't go through the cell phone systems. And so the option there was to have a mumble server and run mumble through our intranet. Yeah? Um, what, it, would, it seemed to me, I mean, I, I would respect what they asked, obviously, uh, because it's, it's, it's their place, but was the case made to them that the more the outside world knows about the conditions and the, and the intent and the desire, the more support they're going to get, especially at a political level? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's... What was their response to that? So, I know someone had to have said that. What right. So that, that was said many, 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 many times. Right. Right. Um, by lots of different people in lots of different ways, and their response was ba basically yes, and and we should keep getting the word out as much as possible, but within certain boundaries, so right? They didn't give a reason, then. So, well, I mean, there, the the reasons for not having things in certain places, like you can't have it at the sacred fire because the sacred fire is sacred space, and you don't want people taking pictures of the fire, you don't want people. Um, N doing non-sacred things. It's like if you're at church and you've got somebody in the corner, um, you know, dancing to rock in their earphones while, I don't know, I'm not Christian, but, you know, like while the Catholic priest is trying to do a mass, like that would be, you know, disturbing to the environment. So they didn't want anything that disturbed the sacredness of that space, right? Um, they also as a community, they had concerns because one of the ways to potentially break the camp and the movement would be to um, fabricate reasons to take children away from families that had children there. So they didn't want people taking pictures of children without the parents' permission, for instance. There were, there were other issues like that that people were very um, sensitive about uh, that were most known to the, the photographers in the environment because of the rules about who, what you were and were not allowed to take pictures of. But they also became issues when it came to where do we have the internet because there were so many people who thought that they should be live streaming everything all the time. They were like, no, <laughs> don't live stream everything all the time. There are, there are many things to live stream, but not everything all the time. Okay. Um, what is Mumble? Oh, Mumble is an, it's an encrypted uh, text and voice uh, system, I guess. So there's a server and there are, are clients for phones and for uh, computers, laptops, whatever. Uh, it's used most of all by gaming teams. Uh, so a lot of gamers know Mumble, uh, but it's also used for other kinds of just groups of people that want to communicate. Uh, I've, I've actually used it in a couple of, um, uh, like, uh, what do you call it, cybersecurity teams where we were doing CDX stuff, um, uh, red team, blue team competitions. In order to keep what we were talking about secret from the other teams, we would use Mumble. Um, so <coughs> that. Um, amazing guy with my monkey in the air in that other picture he he did an incredible thing uh he knew that we needed a bunch of equipment to get started to make this all happen in fact it was about seven thousand dollars worth of equipment including the shipping some of it had to be shipped by rail um and and he literally put the whole thing on his own credit card um, before even putting the GoFundMe up to try to get the money back. Um, hilariously, he and I were standing in an office depot 
picking up a, an extra ethernet cord that somehow didn't come in the shipment when his wife called and said, we just got a call from the bank. They're wondering if this $7,000 uh, charge is fraud. I told them we couldn't possibly have made that charge. And he's like, um, hun, I need to talk to you about that. <laughs> uh, and thank God his wife did not leave him over that. And, and the GoFundMe did get fully funded. <laughs> but that was one brave man. Um, so uh, I had to take... We, several of us, had to take many trips up to uh, Bismarck over the course of a week to go pick up boxes uh, and, and pieces, the, uh, the solar panels for this system, the uh, power beams themselves, several nano beams, a bunch of your, your basic routers, you know, Linksys routers, um, and, and those metal boxes, you know those like electric boxes, the utility boxes? So we actually had two of those utility boxes because we had to set these things up like literally in a field away from camp where nobody would be there to watch it and there was no tent to protect it. So it, it had to be protected in those boxes. So there were many trips to Bismarck. Um, so this is just a, a bit of the pictures of some of the, the bits and bobs and pieces and some of the volunteers. And I, I love that shot of Roberto down there. So the, the power beam, the part that actually is the, the radio and the antenna is in that thing in his hand. Um, and if you point that thing, even without the dish, you can point that thing at another power beam and pick up the, um, the signal. And when we were trying to find the best placement, um, we were driving around with that as if it was a gun. Like, do we have signal? Do we have signal? Do we have signal? It was, it was fun. <laughs> um, so uh, the guy in the picture there with Roberto is a guy named Matt. He works for Standing Rock Telecom. Um, and, and he is an awesome guy. Uh, he basically did all of the, the technical labor on the Standing Rock Telecom side in order to make all of this work. Uh, and one piece of that was that we had to find a place on that ridge on, you know, it's kind of a ridge and a couple of little hills. <laughs> we had to find the right place above camp to where we could best catch that signal from Standing Rock Telecom and then beam it down into camp. So um, you saw that van in the other picture. Um, that's, that's my van. And um, it, it pretended to be a four-wheel drive. I, <laughs> amazing, amazing vehicle. It is dead now. <laughs> may, may it rest in peace. Uh, but this guy in a brand new 4x4 uh, you know, truck from the company took me on the wildest ride, Mad Hatter ride, through, <laughs> um, through the hills and the, the, the fields of that part of North Dakota looking for the right spot to put that. And my poor van followed him like nobody's business. Uh, and, uh, and then we found the spot. Um, now, I put a buffalo here because the, this buffalo was actually, we saw this buffalo the, the next day just wandering through a field, which was pretty cool. Um, but this, uh, this discovery of this particular spot, at, at the moment that we discovered it, we were like, this is perfect. There's this old, who knows how old, 100-year-old or whatever, um, windmill that was... From all we can tell, it was a, a water well pump, uh, but it's long since defunct. But it's it, it's a tower on the hill at exactly the right point, where from that point we could get the signal from the casino or, or right next to the casino, and we could point the signal down into camp. It was perfect, and there's a tower already there. Um, so after we had found this particular place. We went down into camp 
to go gather up the equipment that we needed to start the install. And um, so I'm, I'm there in my van with uh, Roberto Monge, his 11 year old daughter, who actually, um, there had been a debate in the family about whether they should physically go to camp or whether they should just support me from afar. And, um, and his 11 year old daughter said, well, you know the prophecy about the, the eagle and the condor. What if we're bringing the condor and we don't show up? And he was like, oh, dude, that's too much pressure. <laughs> so, so she's in the van with us. And this guy, Tim, uh, who's the son of, there was like a, an older guy sitting in the back of my van in that other picture. So he's also Tim Corcoran. His son, Tim Corcoran, was in the van with me. Um, and, a, and Tim Corcoran Jr. is a, a wilderness uh, connection trainer, right? And as we're driving up to this hill, we see this bird circling the hill. And Roberto goes, is that an eagle? And Tim looks and he's like, no, what are you talking about? That's not an eagle, that's a vulture. <laughs> that's a turkey vulture, whatever. And um, so then we drive up the hill and get up there and install the first pieces of equipment. And, you know, um, it, rolling back just a little bit, right next to this uh, this tower, there's some sacred stones, literally sacred stones. One of the things that we were told when that spot was chosen was that every time we went up to that hill, we should stop and make prayers and, um, and offer tobacco. So we go up there, we offer tobacco, we put the stuff up, we go back, we say some more prayers, we climb back into the van, we head back down the hill, we're coming around the corner back on 1806 and again we see a bird around you know flying around the hill and Roberto's like that one is an eagle and Tim looks up and he says yes it is that is an eagle and we're driving a little bit further a couple seconds and he goes I just thought of something in our bioregion the closest thing to a condor is that turkey vulture <laughs> and all of a sudden we're all like high-fiving, oh my god, it was the condor and the eagle. <laughs> it was meant to be. Um, so, so this system, I just wanted to kind of show some pictures. Um, our, the first place that we put, um, yeah, is this one the first or the second place? I think that this is the first place where we put the power beam. We actually had to move the power beam. Um, because the first location where it was um, had a, a slower connection. It wasn't actually connected directly into the back hall. There was another hop in between. Um, but that, that dish there on the, the tower uh, is our power beam pointed up towards the hop hill. Um, later, we actually put that power beam another like eight miles away directly where the internet backhaul comes into the reservation and our internet speeds went up, it was great. Uh, <laughs> and the small dish that's there in the picture, that's one of the nano beams when we were testing the connection. Um, so, oops, I wanna just click instead of hitting that button. Anyway, um, so, I, I want to like repeat over and over again, this wouldn't have happened without lots of different volunteers. So some people came for a few days, some people came for a few weeks, we had a few people come for a month or more, um, but it was the effort of a lot, a lot of people. Um, and as you can see, there were, <laughs> there were stages in this. We had many, many problems along the way. We had um, some serious hardware failures. We had this one point where I was certain, so I had never personally set up a standalone 
a solar system like this where I'm, you know, plugging the wires into the um, into the charge controller, you know, the wires, not connectors, wires into charge controllers and, and wiring everything up myself. I'm sitting there with instructions, trying to figure the whole thing out. Um, and nobody else that was there with me had ever done this before either at that particular point. And it didn't work. And we couldn't figure out why it didn't work. And um, I was sure that it was completely my fault. And it wasn't until after uh, an actual solar installer came up, tested all of my connections, said, you did a lovely job. The equipment is broken. <laughs> um, and so that was the first of several times where I spent several days saying, I've done it wrong, I've done it wrong, I've done it wrong. And then somebody was like, no, no, the equipment is broken. And finally, they convinced me to swap out the equipment. And sure enough, it was the equipment. Um, in the month that it took us to get the internet live, we had something like 10 different hardware failures. Were brand new, out of the package, pieces of hardware weren't working. Um, now, is this a pure fluke? Were things being tampered with before they got to us? We don't know. Um, one of the things that I do know is that, you know, Snowden in his, in the Snowden papers gave us the hint that things can be intercepted and messed with before they get to us, right? So after those first uh, shipments of equipment, we no longer shipped anything uh, that was digital or electric or electronic. We didn't ship anything like that to camp. If it was electric, electronic, digital, if it was a computer, a tablet, a phone, a solar system, it had to be hand carried into camp from somebody who bought it from a store. Um, because we just did not want to take the risk that the problems we were having was because of sabotage before it got to us. What? Um, so our initial equipment failures went down, but there was continual sabotage actually in camp. Um, but I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> um, again, there were there were so many volunteers that helped. Um, and here's uh, a couple that came. They were only there for a few days. Uh, but, but they were very good at climbing up ladders and, and doing things with wrenches, which I am eternally grateful for. Um, and just, you know, I, I didn't know that I was going to be giving you the, the earlier message about how intense the, the conflict was there. But just as a reminder, we're in a conflict zone. <laughs> and um, in between when we started this and when it actually got finished and we actually had internet, um, the North Camp was raided. Um, and these are some of the pictures from October 27th when the North Camp was raided. Uh, that biggest picture over there, by the way, is my son, very proud. Um, he's 18 now, but he was 17 at the time and he came along with me to camp. And um, when he came with me to Standing Rock, I made the rule that he wasn't allowed to go to the front lines. And he promptly broke that rule. And after the third time he broke that rule, I was like, OK, just please don't get arrested. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he helped out with the medics unit. And, um, and also, he's a, an amateur blacksmith. And he was known throughout camp as blacksmith uh, because he actually had a forge. And um, he made uh, armor for people um, and also helped you know, make tools and utensils that were used around camp, which was kind of cool. I'm not proud or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I was saying, there were, there were a number of equipment failures. Um, this particular piece of equipment, everything looked like it was working. It was getting power. It, you know, it, it should have worked, and yet it wasn't working. And, and these two guys that are in the other picture, they're the ones who are like, no, it's broken. And I'm like, we have no evidence that it's broken. He, they were like, swap it out and see if the other one works. And we had another one of the same device on hand, so I was able to swap it out. 
And sure enough, when we swapped it out, the other one worked perfectly with all the same connections. So it was the device and we had to send that back. Um, so they were, <laughs> I, I needed some, you know, social media buzz and they were kind enough to pose for me. What the hell is wrong with this? <laughs> and then finally, finally, yes, we succeeded. We got the internet connected from end to end. And um, I posted this on Twitter. So, so I love boingboing.net. I don't know if any of you guys read Boing Boing. I love Boing Boing. And they often talk about political issues that other people aren't talking about. And I was somewhat perturbed about the fact that they were not mentioning Standing Rock at all. So I hoped that by tweeting at them about things that were going on at Standing Rock that maybe they would start writing about it. Um, so the very first website that we ever went to when we got the internet working at Standing Rock was boingboing.net. And I tweeted this at them. And you know what? They still didn't talk about Standing Rock. <laughs> Grr. Um, so you asked about the, uh, the equipment failures. <laughs> well, this, uh, I, I have this here to sort of represent many of the problems that we had. Uh, there were infiltrators in camp, many infiltrators, and there is no way, well, there were sometimes ways to know who was an infiltrator and who wasn't an infiltrator, but the vast majority of the time you couldn't tell if somebody was an infiltrator or not. You would kind of have this feeling like, this guy is kind of acting weird sometimes, or why is this person asking so many questions? But especially when you're talking about tech stuff and people are interested in tech stuff, if you're like geeking out about something, you're gonna ask lots of technical questions. And geeky people love talking about the technical details, right? And so having the discipline to not talk about the technical details can be difficult. And also having the foresight to be able to tell, is this person asking me questions because they're geeking out on how cool this is? Or are they asking me questions because they're trying to figure out how they can sabotage what you're doing? Um, and it was a learning process to figure out how secret we had to be. Because, you know, I'm an open source girl. Open source? <laughs> so this idea of trying to keep something secret that does not sit well with me, and yet it was very necessary. Now, um, I had one vet on my team who was purposely uh, dropping misinformation out in the world uh, about the internet connection that we had just gotten. And two days after our internet was working at the internet cafe, it wasn't really an internet cafe, it was just the dome, but two days after our internet cafe was working, um, we drove by and we noticed in Cannonball, uh, by the, the 1806 Cannonball Road intersection, this uh, utility cabinet was open. And she's like, pull over, let's go look at that. So we got down and we looked at it and we realized that sure enough, this is the fiber connection for uh, Cannonball, for the town of Cannonball, which is just a couple of miles away from where we were. And uh, somebody had pulled out a bunch of the wires and had randomly cut one. And we can only assume that they thought that they were getting us, but they weren't. Um, and, um, and then the snow came. <laughs> um, actually, before I get to then the snow came, uh, also, within the first two weeks of having internet, um, in the first two weeks, we had two different routers in the dome. And mind you, they're way up at the top of the dome. We had two different routers get sabotaged. The first one was sabotaged by somebody walking in and just cutting the wires to the battery that was running the router up on the ceiling. Um, and the second one was, the second sabotage, we can only guess that it was done through a, like a software side hack um, where, where somebody got into the, the administration of the, 
uh, the router itself and boosted the radios until they blew themselves out because suddenly it wasn't working anymore. And when we pulled the thing down, um, we discovered that all three radios in this heavy duty router were all blown. They were they were fried, like as in you sniff them and they, they're fried. Um, pfft, what the heck? And that was just the first two weeks. Um, later we had, what? First two weeks. In the first two weeks of having internet. Yeah, and then we had another router in the same location uh, get sabotaged again later, um, you know, cut down and destroyed. So we went through many routers in just just the, you know, kind of like your, an office router, not like the nano beams. We went through quite a few of those uh, during the time that the internet was running. Yeah. Cool brand of router. So we didn't use just one brand for the for the regular routers. We basically used whatever we could get. A couple of times we went out and just bought routers, and I think those were Linksys's. But um, <laughs> uh, but some of the other routers. So so we had that the big one was um, like the the one expensive router, and we were only using like I said like office style routers because those were serving sometimes 250 people at a time, right? So we needed heavy duty routers for that. The other routers that we were using were more like um, household routers that we were using for the intranet. Um, now the intranet routers, they went up and down, got stolen, disappeared, wandered off. Like at, there was a certain point at which we gave up trying to maintain the intranet because we just could not keep up with the, the issue of either the power was gone, because mind you, everything was running on solar or wind power, or the, the router itself disappeared or was damaged. Um, and so, and then the winter came. Um, and if, <laughs> if you like good stories about winter, um, I, I wrote a, a little adventure story about getting to the bathroom on Christmas night. <laughs> it's on Medium. You should look it up. <laughs> um, it, it was cold. It was very, very cold. The, the worst day was 27 below zero. But 20 below zero was a, a normal day through the winter. And this is what we lived in, army tents. Um, there were some people who had yurts, uh, there were teepees, um, and there were what we called tarpies. They were shaped like teepees, um, but they were uh, um, like a, a, round, uh, a round piece at the top, a round piece at the bottom, and then two by fours between them, and then um, uh, tarps and then insulation to keep them warm. Um, <clears throat> and basically all of us had wood stoves or there were some um, uh, propane, small propane stoves uh, in places around camp. We did have a few tent fires uh, and, and structure fires when that would happen, it would be quite stressful. Everybody in the, the sub camp around that would get together to douse the fire because if one of those fires were to spread through camp, that would be devastating. Um, luckily, and really truly by miracle, nobody died of freezing to death. Nobody died from carbon monoxide inhalation or uh, getting burned, like all the horrible things that could have happened in a winter like this, living in the conditions that we were living in, didn't happen. Um, you know, thank whoever it is to thank, right? Um, so the, the pictures around the edge are actually the tech tent, and the picture at the bottom uh, is the larger uh, tent. It was called Johnny's Tent, but it was sort of a, a community tent um, where a lot of meetings were held. Uh, not the not the big community meetings that were held in the dome, but more like uh, 
leaders and and uh, team leaders and things like that came in to meet there. And as you can see here, Cornell West. That was cool. Um, <laughs> No, no, Johnny Aceron. Johnny Aceron was, um, for all intents and purposes, the, um, the operations leader at camp. He was the one that coordinated all the other team leaders to get stuff done, right? Um, so yeah, so our tent, uh, we had the, the wood stove that's there. We had um, fairy lights around the top, that was our lighting system. We had, we had enough power to run our laptops, uh, and we had a ton of random equipment that you can't really see very well in this. And we also had um, cot bunk beds. That picture over there with the guy on the top bunk and, and the girl doing this on the bottom bunk, when I posted that to the Guab Facebook page, my dad snarkily said, what are we looking here at here? Somebody doing a countdown about how long until they die from suffocation? But it, they actually were quite comfortable. Um, so uh, I talk a lot about the dome or the internet cafe. This is the dome. Uh, it was put up by um, the Red Lightning Collective from Burning Man um, and the power system that you see there was one of the power systems that Geeks Without Bounds was not responsible for. We did not put that up. Uh, uh, Red Lightning rented that rig right there. Um, and we put one of the nano beams uh, up on that rig for a while until, ta-da, <laughs> somebody cut the thing down. So. That is a power over ethernet cord. Had they just cut that power over ethernet cord, they would have probably fried the nano beam in the process. They knew enough to sabotage the power system that was powering it first, and then to cut it down, and then they took the nano beam away. Um, now, why would you want to take the nano beam away? There's obviously that you want to stop us from having communications, but the nanobeam in particular, by taking it away intact, that nanobeam had our network keys on it. Um, so basically, and it has like a 10 mile range. So basically they could go far away from us, point that thing at our network and get onto our network. So after that happened, we had to change our network keys. Um, so, and again, many, many volunteers <laughs> helped out with this endeavor, uh, and we had problems, as you can imagine, with our little hacked communication tower <laughs> in the winter with the high winds and the snow, and there were times when you could not get up that hill at all. Um, I once, the day after a really bad storm, I climbed up that hill with no snowshoes, with no vehicle, I just climbed the stupid hill, sinking down into the snow every time until I got to the part of the hill where it was too steep so that the snow wouldn't build up. It, it took me two hours to climb the stupid hill. <laughs> so I only did that once. <laughs> um, but yeah, we had to we had to get ice and snow off of the snow the solar panels to keep it working. Uh, after windstorms, we had to fix things. Uh, and this uh, woman, Jillian, uh, the one who's all in black and and uh, crouched down there, amazing amazing woman, network engineer, goddess. I don't know what she did. But uh, after she fixed this, we didn't have any problems with the system for a month and a half. That was the longest we went with no problems to the system. Um, so that's my time. And um, this is a picture from one of my friends there, Tim Yakaitis, uh, and a reminder that the revol revolution will not be televised, may however be live streamed. So 
Wopila, that's thank you in Lakota, to the youth of Standing Rock who led the call to protect the Missouri River, to the people of the Great Sioux Nation who welcomed us into our land, and to all the volunteers, donors, supporters, keyboard warriors, and the senders of the chocolate, and all the other water protectors. <laughs> thank you guys. Sorry? Did you see Jordan Sheridan there? Did I see Jordan Sheridan? I don't know. I, I may have and just not be.